a lot of people are into uh, property investment because they like property, right? And even though it may not necessarily be the asset class that performs the best over the long term in terms of return, it's what they do because they're into it. Yep. They, you know? I wonder if there's something in that. And I wonder if as you, as you start to figure out that there's this whole ecosystem out there where there's companies that are producing things and run by people that you can relate to, Maybe there, maybe there is a way to bridge that gap from those who invest in that traditional asset class to shift over into more equities because they can see that actually these are things that we already believe in. We're into that. We're yeah. into healthcare or we're into innovative technology or you know fintech startups. How can we get a piece of that action because we really want to be involved in that space? And um, when it's aligned to who you are, I totally agree. I've, I've, I've seen this so many times with people when, when they start doing things that's aligned with who they already are, they succeed. Yep. You can't put on something else. It just doesn't work, eh? No, your property analogy is, is good, and um, and I understand property as well because it's tangible and it's right in your face. In New Zealand, I mean, there's no hiding it. We are just in love with property. Mm. But here's the good news about the equities. There's a lot of the same principles that you apply and that are in innate apply to equities as well. And so whatever you think about when you think about buying a property, you can apply so many of those elements to buying shares cool. and identifying quality. So, um, you know, we can take a variety of examples. Um, one of the examples is, if we, so just taking this a step back and saying, okay, how do I look at a, a, at a business rather than a property? And there are only a couple of little things that I would, say you start with and you literally work down the picking order of them okay the first of them we've spoken about which says is this a sector that you're interested in <clears throat> because otherwise you're going to forget it okay. and you might as well give up on that the second thing is to say ask yourself is does this business have it what we term in the trade a terminal value and the terminal value is the um, value of a business beyond what can be reasonably forecast so investors, whether you're buying a home or whether you're buying shares, we like to believe that this property or business will last into perpetuity. Okay? Something that's eternal. That's exactly. And f interestingly, um, because all investors think like that, um, it usually makes up between 40 and 60% of a share price or the value of a business. Mm, okay. But you as an individual have got a gut feel on whether or not there is a terminal value. It's not a financial number. The, 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 the accumulated calculation of what it's worth is a financial number, but how you, how you arrive at it is not. So if you run in your own mind without you know, verbalizing it, ask yourself, will Auckland Airport be around in 20 years' time? Will JB Hi-Fi be around in 20 years' time? Will Sky TV be around in 20 years' time? Mm. Will Porta Tauranga be around in 20 years' time? Will Zero? Will A2 Milk? Okay, so that's not something anybody can answer today, but you yourself have got a real gut feel on that, mm. and that's what's called a terminal value. And if we think about our mate Warren Buffett, <coughs> he always looks at investing, and he, he's, he's got the little byline that says, when you think about investing in shares, pretend you could only invest in five companies for the rest of your life. If you play through what we've just spoken about, That's step right. one is, am I interested in it? Because this is the rest of my life. And step two, is it going to be around for the rest of my, for life. The rest of my life? Or even beyond, really, because you want or it beyond. to still have a value at time of sale. Yep. Now, you don't need me. You don't need anybody. But if you're talking to somebody and you're thinking about a business, say, do I like it? And is this going to be around for a long, long time? Mm, it's good. And if it ain't, there's so many stocks to choose from. Mm. Okay, but that's the same thing you apply when you think about property. That's if you right. look at it and you go, hang on, this thing's going to be crumbling in five years' time, or hang on, there's a whole new motorway coming through here, so they're going to actually get rid of this, or hang on, it's this ocean town front. is, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's ocean front. You know, there's water lapping at the door, you that's know? That's right, yeah. So there's a terminal value element. Yeah. The second element when you think about, or the third element when you think about shares versus property that's critical is leverage, is debt. Okay, exactly. and it's exactly yeah. the same process. So if you think about taking on a mortgage, the more, the higher the mortgage is, well, guess what happens is you're starting to pay more money out as interest. That's less money for new carpeting. That's less ability to go and put on a new extension. That's less ability to buy another house. That's less ability to it's put food on the table. Yeah. And so when you think about shares, look at the leverage and sit there and say, hang on, the more debt they have, 
the harder it is to invest in maintaining the business, in growing the business, in buying new businesses, and expanding the business. That's the debt equity ratio. You're looking at that, and that tells you a story 100%. right away. And right? this is not hard. So because because people already start to glaze off at that point, and they go, yeah, but that's really hard in the share market. But it's not. It is exactly what you do, and you think about in property. And the same is also true where you think about how banks lend to property owners. Same is metrics. Same metrics. If I'm a surgeon, right, they're more than likely going to lend me a little bit more money because there's a little bit certainty, more certainty around it than lending it to Daniel, who's an entrepreneur, who doesn't have any they of that don't stability. Like you, Daniel. They don't Sorry like to me. say, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so lending to Auckland Airport, you can lend a little bit more, and it's going to be on better rates. Mm. Lending to zero mm. is a little bit trickier. So it's exactly the same principles. These are not things that. I have to go to university to learn. These mm. are things that are directly in front of you. And there's a couple of advantages as well when you think about it. Like, you can't, at the moment, buy just a fraction of a property, a fraction right. of a residential investment property, within reason. But you can, you, with Auckland Airport. You can buy yep. as much as you want, really. And you can scale in and you can scale out. It's, it's a truly analog experience, moving in and out of ownership of that company. Whereas with residential property, you can't. Yeah. which is you know higher level of liquidity yeah but much it's more liquid. you know but it's also something that you can you can scale in and out and that's sometimes really useful when you're trying to adjust your portfolio through time whereas when you hold property it said these are digital moves that you're making it's they're on or off you own it you don't it's it's different in, in some ways but in a, in a lot of ways I hear what you're saying it's it's very very similar yeah and so that bridge between investing in investment properties and investing in the share market, that need not be a very scary bridge to walk across, right? I don't think so, but I think there's an underlying thing that that is that probably overrides any of the financial components, because I totally agree with you. That's why I prefer the share market, is because when it becomes expensive, I can exit it, and when it becomes cheap, I can enter it. And mm -hmm. for some reason, when you, when you think about property, it's because it's such a long-term asset, people think in the share market, when I buy a business, I have to hold it for eternity, and when I decide to sell those shares, I will never ever buy them again. And you go, well, no, you can buy them again later if they become cheaper. But part of the challenge uh, that with, with people I chat to, part of the challenge in New Zealand is that there is a social currency that is attached to property that is not attached to shares. That's right, yeah. And, and that is a very hard bridge. You know, truth be told, whenever you go out to uh, you know, meet new people, they go, what do you do and where do you live? That's right. And do you rent or do you own? That's right. Right, and and you kind of you can't say to them, I sort of live in a shed out the back of somebody else's home, and I sort of you know I couch surf, but man, I got this really interesting equity portfolio. Mm. Your social currency, there's this sort of weird social divide. You're right. Yeah, the You're people right. who have property and the people who don't have property. That's right. And so that is a massive social burden, I think, for Kiwis, especially younger Kiwis. Because if they ain't on the property ladder, there's this there's this weirdness that exists when communicating it. And I wonder if that's an intergenerational thing. Like I wonder if within, say, if you're you know under 35 years old, I wonder if that's actually going to be okay and normal not to own property. And to a certain degree, I kind of hope to you know that that is going to be okay and it won't be weird that you couch surf or you're still flatting or you're still living with mum. Maybe that part will be weird. <laughs> depending on how old you are <laughs> but if you're um if you're at that, in that at that generation I, th I think there's there's actually hope to bring some balance to this investing ecosystem where people are a little bit more truly diversified i think some work needs to be done with property i, I i'm i'm personally involved with this to some degree but i'd love to see it divided divisible and tradable I think I think there's a future there because if you can fragment that asset, you can actually get more people on board. Because right now it is exclusive. Yep. You know, unfortunately, it's out of reach. But I think that um, with the younger generation, you know, sub 35 years old, it feels to me anyway that it is starting to become more normal to be an investor. Do you pick that up as well? Like, do you, do you think that there's obviously there's the older people that have lots of wealth yep. and they're just managing their wealth. But in terms of the wealth developers, those who are just starting out, are you seeing that there's a bit of a revival going on there? Or is that just my wishful thinking? Uh, I don't know. Um, but what will be interesting is when those 25-year-olds become 35. Mm. Will they have shifted into, actually, no, I do need a home. So at 25, you're carefree, you're traveling the world. Uh, the 
the experiences and the concerts you go to are the most important things because that gives you your Facebook clicks or likes. <coughs> the question is when that 25-year-old becomes 35, do then they start to switch into the same mindset of now I should have accreted enough wealth and now I should have my own home and I don't and my peers do. I don't know. It's hard to say, isn't it? Very hard. Because may maybe maybe it's a myth that we have to lo own the property that we live in. Yeah. Look, I come from a place where I, I, I don't get it myself because I see it as a financial asset along with shares. And, yeah, it's just and an, it's just I switch asset. between cash and between fixed income and between property and I've had properties in the past and, and, yeah. and equities. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I s because I didn't grow up here, I don't um, truly as understand that part of it at a, at a guttural level, but you can definitely see it is That's the right. challenge. And so therefore, which says to our point, is that I think is a bigger divide for the share market versus the property market mm -hmm. than understanding shares versus understanding property because you can always get advice on both and, and you can learn both. Mm. Um, it's just the social element to me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I might be wrong. Who knows? I doubt it though, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> Out of the two people in this room, I'm I'm, I'm pretty sure.